We're here with Philippe Bourgois, um, who is the Richard Perry Professor of Anthropology and Family and Community Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Long title. Yeah, um, embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Very impressive. <laughs> you know, actually, it's, it's embarrassing because, it, it, I mean, he's a great guy and everything, but it's all about the whole privatization of knowledge in the United States. Mm -hmm. So we get funded by you know, individuals and so forth. But he's a, he's a wonderful guy. He's a, he's a cool guy, super progressive, uh, <laughs> nice person. But, um, but it is an ironic thing for someone who does critical anthropology to, to, to be sponsored. <laughs> I guess we can talk about that, about more of that later. Right. Um, maybe, maybe to start off, um, one question I've asked everyone in, in this series is, how did you come into anthropology? What, what, what drove you into the field or, or what circumstance? <laughs> Often it's a particular luck or circumstance that brings people to anthropology. What was it for you? You know, um, for me, anthropology was one of the few totally effortless things uh, to stumble into. I was a, I didn't know what anthropology was. I was a freshman in college, and I sort of at semi-random said, well, I better sort of, I have to decide what my major is. I better take, you know, a little philosophy, you know, a philosophy class of this. I don't know what this anthropology is. I'll try that. And um, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, I didn't dislike my other classes, but they, none of them excited me. With anthropology, the first book that they assigned, I just, Wow, it was it was literally like falling in love. I remember specifically the, the the I was on the ski team and we were at some whatever some you know we were in some gym sleeping on cots, and I couldn't stop myself from reading the uh, the, the textbooks that they had assigned. What was the book? You know, it's a, it's an embarrassing book to talk about now because, <laughs> um, especially with the work that I do on violence, because it was a it was a book that's now completely. Um, sort of uh, critiqued in anthropology for very good reason by Napoleon Chagnon, right. the fierce people. And it was the very first edition that's even worse than all the other editions. It, you know, on, I mean, some people argue that it's his, uh, his rape fantasy, his, ma you know, his masculinist rape fantasies. But basically it's about the Yanomamo um, uh, Amazonian native peoples. And they're, they're an extraordinary set of people. And, ha and he specifically focused on, on basically male violence. So from those beginnings, um, you took it as a major. What about your graduate work? You know, I didn't take it as a major, actually, because in the United States, we have this four-field thing where we have archaeology, phys... I don't know if you have that in Australia. Yeah, you know, thank God. So <laughs> you, we have archaeology, biology, linguistics, and cultural. And, um, it, you know, it, it has to do, of course, with the origins of anthropology, get at understanding humans by any means necessary. It's a nice romantic idea of, of being completely multidisciplinary, multi-method, and so forth. But unfortunately, um, you know, many of us who are interested in cultural anthropology just aren't interested in analyzing bones or analyzing dinosaurs or analyzing rocks or, and so forth. So uh, because it was a U.S. department, in those days you were obliged to take one class in each field. I just didn't want to do that. I only wanted to do cultural anthropology. So, I mean, some of my best friends are archaeologists and linguists and <laughs> physical really anthropologists, so. <laughs> but, but, um, but I just wasn't interested in reading that. So I majored in social studies in, instead, in interdisciplinary, um, basically, social theory, um, which was great because then you just read the, the, the classics, you know, Marx, Freud, Weber, Durkheim, and so forth, and, and um, it gave you a good background for then getting into the nitty-gritty of, of ethnography and anthropology. Mm. I was actually wondering if I could ask about your, um, your graduate study fieldwork and whether when you entered into that field you already had the idea, I mean already your reference to Napoleon Chagnon in some ways is a, is a bit of a prelude to your focus on violence, or I know, although I know that it's you know, a bit of a 180 degree um, flip, but um, I'm wondering if you had the idea to, to take a particular focus on the phenomenon of violence as you entered into grad studies, or if that was something that was more circumstantial once you got there? Actually, um, the very f my, f my actual PhD was, um, 
was in Central America. It wasn't the work in the U.S. inner city on on uh, drugs and violence. And I at that by then I had read the I had started the critiques were already coming out of Chagnon and traditional anthropology and so forth. So I was already very um, I was already trying to buck that trend. And uh, what I wanted to do was study. Um, you know the quote-unquote boring people that anthrop not the exotic other but uh, but just the the you know masses of people that are starving dying and 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 suffering so I I studied banana workers uh, on a United Fruit Company plantation I also wanted to study the effects of my own country on you know these exotic parts of the world, which was another thing that you know was another one of the original sins of anthropology, in a sense, where it had been part of a colonial project, often unconsciously, and 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 usually as a progressive force, you know, usually as people critiquing racism. As a matter of fact, you know, critiquing, um, you know, yeah, basically um, wanting, you know, with cultural relativism, wanting to come in and learn about people and so forth. But um, so what I wanted to do was take head on uh, the effects of U.S. multinational corporations on traditional people, and and so that's that and that book ended up being, um, gosh, what was it called? It was called Ethnicity at Work: Divided Labor on a Central American Banana Plantation, and um, and so at that point I wasn't thinking of myself whatsoever as studying violence. You know, I, I did. I, I don't know if I had the concept yet of structural violence, but that's what the book ended up being a study in some sense of structural violence, of the effects of these. This was a this was a six thousand hectare plantation that spanned the Panama and Costa Rica border in a beautiful spot right on the Caribbean of Central America, spectacular place, um, and it's just turned it into a pesticide nightmare, destroyed the reefs, the, and and it's and what the company did was import indigenous people and people from all over the world, Caribbean people from the Caribbean, people from actually they they imported Italians originally. But they, they, uh, but the Italians all became um, anarchist union organizers. So they, that was the end of that very rapidly. But it was the famous United Fruit Company, the Chiquita Banana, and so forth. So, um, so that I, th that was what I looked at was the divide and conquer dynamics that the company used with with the amazing ethnic diversity. There, there were Kuna Amerindians. Um, Nagobe Amerindians, and then about three or four different uh, Latino ethnic groups, and then people of Jamaican descent who had a, a whole new ethnic identity as Creole, uh, Creole Costa Ricans. Mm. But b before even that, or was it after you were working in, in Nicaragua? Yeah, actually, that was actually my really my first field work. But, but, uh, that was actually, um, I, I, what I did was I dropped out of graduate. I thought I was dropping out of graduate school in my second year when the Sandinistas had the, did the revolution in 1979 in Nicaragua. And I took, I, I did hedge my bets. I took a leave of absence, and my university kindly gave me a leave of absence. But I had no intention of going back if the revolution had, you know, had been the dream that I was hoping it was going to be. And so I, I just went down and volunteered to work for the agrarian reform ministry. Um, I was doing field work at the time for my master's um, thesis. I was in Belize, which is you know, a tiny country um, that used to be a British colony. Um, uh, on the border with Guatemala and Mexico, and I was depressed. I, I, I was with the Mopan Maya people, actually, uh, and, and I'd chosen the place for very, very practical reasons, because I didn't speak Spanish at the time, and they were bilingual um, Mopan and English speakers. And, um, and I was looking at the construction of a road into this Maya community to see how it was going to affect traditional um, uh, reciprocal labor exchange arrangements and see if there was going to be cultural destruction, basically, because of a greater integration into the market economy. And I, I was seeing that it was going to be a disaster. <laughs> and I was getting really depressed and listening on my shortwave radio that there was this revolution taking place in Nicaragua. And I said, well, that's where I'm going to go, where there's some kind of hope, where, where indigenous peoples could be, you know, could be, could perhaps benefit from something from the market economy without getting destroyed by it, um, which was a somewhat naive thought, but, um, but it was a hopeful thought, and it seemed possible. So I went down 
and the um, agrarian reform folks said, oh, you're a gringo. You gringos love Indians. You know, we're all a bunch of racists here. We don't like Indians. You're, you go out into the Indian territory that you gringos like to hang out in and tell us what the, you know, figure out what the problems are and find a solution for them. It was an incredible, exci incredibly exciting thing. So I took a, a plane uh, into the Mesquitia, uh, where the, the, which is the territory that's the, the home territory of the Mosquito Amerindians, as well as the, at that time they were called the Sumu, now they're called the, the Ulwa. Um, peoples, and um, and um, and they were at the high. They were, and so that was it. That was my first field work, and and uh, we wrote a report. There was a team of us. We wrote a report that was just a little bit too radical for the Sandinista Revolution. We called for regional autonomy for the indigenous people, which, in retrospect, they they actually accepted that. But in, their first reaction was to throw us out. And so they threw me out of the country, and that's why I ended up going back to graduate school, <laughs> thank God, and continuing anthropology. Um, and, and that's why uh, I continued in the Caribbean region of Central America during that period. I just went one country further south to Costa Rica. By then, I spoke flu fluent Spanish. And, um, and, then, and, and then ended up on the United Fruit Company plantation, still looking at indigenous peoples, but in their, you know, in their active um, struggles and, and, and interface with being suddenly thrust into being basically wage laborers on, on, um, you know, on, in factories in the field, basically, on those huge banana plantations. One issue that sort of comes out of all this is you know, how do you how do you view anthropology as a discipline, and, and what what do you think the role of anthropologists is? Is it to affect change with and for the people we work with, or is it rather to document the struggles or what, whatever their lives are like? You know, there's it's 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 um it's it's all of the above and more. You see, on um on uh, on a very basic level, it's still the original project for me for of anthropology, which is to understand humans by any means necessary in some sense. And I think in that sense, it's it's a discipline that if, you know I don't want to be overly hubristic about our discipline, but I think we have just this extraordinary method that for some reason other disciplines for the most part distrust, which is our participant observation ethnographic methods. And um, it becomes our common sense. It becomes our way to know about things, at least in cultural anthropology. So, um, so on that level, I, I, I am working towards that project, that sort of romantic project of figuring out human, whatever it is, whether it's whatever we are. Um, and then um, at the same time, there's also the particular relationship of anthropology to non-state peoples, to indigenous peoples who, um, you know, at the time of the origins of anthropology were basically being colonized, genocided, and, and, and conquered. And so one of the impetuses of, you know, to, to put a positive spin on it, the, the impetus of anthropology was, hey, all these people are being destroyed. There's a tremendous amount to learn from them. From them, it's a tragedy. We need to respect them. We need to learn from them. We need, to, and and that was the whole brilliant insight of of cultural relativism and and being suddenly you know making realizing that we can learn about ourselves from others and and um, and also learn um, sort of about truth from others <laughs> in some sense and that whatever we think is right and virtuous is not necessarily what others think and you know one person's virtue is another's um, violence in some sense and especially now when when we look at whatever the Middle East and so forth when, uh, one person's you know one person's terror is another's um, you know God gift to humanity. So, um, in that sense, um, the uh, w you know w what what uh, what w the 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 traditional people that anthropology had always focused on indigenous people peoples on the margins of state economies are you know I would argue the people that are in the most vulnerable relationship to the contemporary world. They're the people whose territories are being, you know, destroyed by mining companies. That are that, that it's where warlords take over and, and so forth, and so they're being dragged into 
um, the 21st century, often from you know, very different modes of production, from very different ways of understanding the world, ways of, of, of earning their living, of, of subsistence farming or hunter-gathering or whatever they're, they're doing to survive. Um, in, in extraordinarily, extraordinarily rapidly, and 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 so that creates, a, a, you know, that's just a recipe for social suffering in that sense. So that that was what attracted me to Central America and to working with indigenous people that were in those rapid processes of being incorporated into states and incorporated into multinational corporation labor forces in that sense. But you know, all through that time. I really wanted to be somewhere else. But this was a long time ago. This was, the, this was 1979, right, was when I started uh, uh, my field work in, in Nicaragua. Um, and it still wasn't quite legitimate, at least in US anthropology, for someone to study their hometown, right? I really wanted to be studying my hometown in New York City and to be looking at what I saw to be the central contradiction and sort of outrage of my society, which is US inner city segregation. This phenomenon of the ghetto is what it was called then. And it's, it's still a good term for it. Um, and so I grew up right on the border between the very wealthy neighborhood and the, and the poorest neighborhood of New York, right on the border of East Harlem. On the, on the Upper East Side. So I, I would see it every day uh, in some sense. I would get mugged by the kids, the kids in gangs uh, from the Puerto Rican neighborhood who'd come down to, write, to mug the little white boys. And, and, um, and I could see that this just wasn't normal. And then luckily I had a French I have a French father, he's still alive, 92. And um, to, uh, it, it sounds horrible in retrospect, but you know, basically the rich whites of the city drive through the poor part of town to avoid traffic to get to the highways, right? And that's their contact with segregation. That's the inter-ethnic contact. That's the tragedy of the United States and the whole suburban structure of, of our cities. And my father, being French, would just start ranting and raving about how horrible and inexcusable this racism and segregation was. And we'd be driving out to you know, a countryside to the beaches, and he'd say, what a shame, this, this wealthy country with this extraordinary poverty, with this you know, bizarre structured racism that's, that's just literally from one block to the next uh, in, in the United States. So I kept hearing that, and I took it seriously in some sense. And so I bas I, uh, when I came back, um, to write my dissertation from the banana plantation. I stayed there two and a half years. I, um, I, uh, it was right in the beginning of the Reagan administration, and the first thing that happened was my uh, federal funding was cut. <laughs> it was just everyone was getting cut back then. It's, it hasn't, still hasn't recovered, right? Um, and, and so I ran out of money and ended up saying, used that as an excuse to move into the inner city, get a cheap apartment, and write my dissertation there. So I wrote my dissertation while living uh, in East Harlem. Um, and when you're writing a dissertation, you become great at procrastinating. It's a, it's a, it's a, or anyone that writes a term paper becomes great at procrastinating. It's a horrible thing because you're really suffering if you just sit down and do it. But you, what, what happens is everything anyone says to you becomes incredibly interesting. And you become so adroit at your socialization. You just become a great you know, chit-chatter, schmoozer, and so forth. So I started hanging out on the stoop of my house, the, the, you know, the stairs in front of my tenement, and making friends with everyone. And it became a phenomenal fieldwork site. And so that led to my second book, which was in the one that's better known, which is In Search of Respect, Selling Crack in El Barrio. Uh, the first book that I wrote, Ethnicity at Work, it only sold 800 copies. I love the book, but <laughs> no one reads it. But um, so this next book, In Search of Respect, um, I uh, ended up spending five and a half years. And in that whole process, you know, I, I was a young man then, so I went through the normal, whatever, the things that one does, which is, you know, get married, and break up, and, <laughs> and, and have a baby, and, and, and get a job, and so forth. And so in that, so it was, um, uh, it was in that, I ended up being five and a half years there, um, and made, fr and while I was there, the, the crack epidemic hit the, hit the United States. It was the moment of transition. 
um, between heroin and cocaine, and the Colombian cartels were just getting into smuggling cocaine. And then someone figured out how to make crack, which is just the you know cocaine with with baking soda that makes it easier to smoke and 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 has a stronger, more immediate effect. And um, so I, I that was also that was the moment when the levels of violence went shooting up in the United States. And um, and and the, that that this this form of mass incarceration, hyper incarceration of poor African American and Latino young men mostly, um, began to you know started. So that was 1985 was when I started that field work, and I stayed there um, uh, through 19, through 1991 was when I left, and um, and I watched my neighbors and friends get sucked into that crack economy. Um, and become sellers and users for the most part. And, um, and I spent most of my time with, with one particular network of sellers who operated, uh, they operated in a video arcade. Back then it was Pac-Man. I don't know, but people today probably don't even remember. It was a great, it was a great game, like they just don't have anymore. And um, it, so it was a Pac-Man arcade, and, but it sold crack. <laughs> yeah, crack man. Exactly. <laughs> it was called. Oops, it was called the game room. Actually, now it's a. I think it's a barber shop now. <laughs> but um, and so that then, um, uh, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing in the sense I didn't know that drugs was gonna. You know that that the whole relationship with drug selling and drug using was gonna be the focus of my work at that point. But I had really no other option in a sense. That's what that's what happened to the neighborhood, and um, and that's where I've been more or less ever since. About what is that? Uh, Twenty years later, thirty years later, right? Thirty years later, since I do uh, since we do qualitative research, I'm terrible at <laughs> at counting the years. But um, and I think on some level, um, the management. Uh, or not, not so much, well, the management, but also the expression of urban poverty uh, uh, often expresses itself or centrally expresses itself through um, substance abuse, through um, partially because it's an economic resource in the sense that when people don't have access to legal employment, the, the underground economy, which and the biggest part of the underground economy is the, is the global narcotics economy, um, takes over and it becomes the common sense of, of ambitious people growing up in neighborhoods where there's absolutely no jobs. And that's what I was watching. I was, wa I, I was looking at that moment of deindustrialization in New York City and then the influx of a new set of jobs that were tragically these jobs selling crack. Mm. And, um, and so that was that project and, and um, that was um, uh, the, the, the next project I did um, was I got, I got a job in, at, in San Francisco at the, and, um, and um, I guess I basically have to study wherever I am. I, I mean, I have to do ethnography wherever I am. I, I, I call it my therapy in some sense. I, on some level, it's the only way I know how to deal with the world. And it's also a great way of dealing with upsetting problems in some sense because you can document them, analyze them, and, 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 and hope that you can represent them in a way that that tremendous amount of suffering that you're documenting isn't, um, isn't for nothing in some sense. That the stories of people that are being crushed by their circumstances or that are you know, fighting against uh, difficult circumstances won't just be forgotten, won't just be swept under the rug, but can be brought to a larger, larger audience. So, um, so what I did then uh, upon moving into to San Francisco, which is sort of the city of gentrification, right? It's the city of, with the highest income, you know, concentrated in the United States and so forth, was look, I, the, the, the phenomenon of homelessness was just completely in your face. You couldn't, you couldn't walk anywhere without someone panhandling, and you couldn't, you couldn't, and the people from the suburbs couldn't even drive their cars in without being panhandled, the, 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 because the homeless would fly signs, as they say, um, begging for money at the, um, at the highway interpasses and interchanges. So I, so I said, that's what I have to study. And every time I went anywhere out of my neighborhood, I would have to drive back by one particular corner where there were guys flying signs. So I said, that's, that's, that's where I'll be. And um, it was about six blocks from my house. 
and I made friends with a network of homeless heroin injectors. I didn't quite know they were heroin injectors at the time, but I could sort of tell they were nodding out with that telltale heroin nod. Um, uh, but they smoked crack, drank alcohol, and, and injected heroin, and they were, um, I get, they were actually my age at that time. <laughs> right? They were in their 30s, late 30s, I guess. Um, and um, and, and uh, I, that project took much too long. I, I had, I guess, I don't know if you can call it fun, but I, in, it, it, but I had too much fun. I mean, it's a lot more fun to do ethnography than to write it up. So I just kept getting, I just kept extending it and saying I don't have enough information. And then all of a sudden, uh, 10 years had passed. And I said, oh, well, now I have to study the aging process. <laughs> Of, of, uh, and um, so that ended up taking 12 years. And that came out as Righteous Dope Fiend. Um, and on some level, it takes off where In Search of Respect um, um, uh, sort of, uh, d uh, you know, where Search of Respect ended. In, so in Search of Respect, I talk about the dealers and I talk about the dream of, of you know, making it in the, in the narcotics economy and the impossibility of it and the violence. And, and that's associated with all of that, and also specifically about the, the colonial U.S.-Puerto Rican relationship that sets Puerto Ricans up to be in this most vulnerable position within the global narcotics economy. Um, but I didn't deal with addiction, per se. On some, I, had a, I had like, um, whatever, a few hundred field notes on, on, on addiction. It was just like one of the chapters that I cut out because you know, I had to cut the book at two, whatever it was, 250 pages. And it was a complicated subject that I couldn't really understand either because the guys that I was with were selling, so they always had enough money. They, were addic they had gotten addicted both to smoking crack and, and, and um, there, there was just a psychological addiction, but um, they were also getting physically addicted to sniffing heroin. Um, and I was watching it, but they were so triumphant about it and they had so much money about it that they were able to sort of maintain a denial um, about it. And I was able to sort of not be able to understand it, not be able to understand its importance in some sense. And also I wanted to stay in denial. These were my friends. They were, I, I still had, I, you know, I still shared some of their hope even though I saw that objectively they were going to be spending the rest of their life cycling chronically through prison and, and, and in and out of treatment and, and, and in addiction. And, um, and they were, you know, engaging in tremendous violence against their loved ones and against themselves and, and each other. As well, but um, so when I the, going to um, San Francisco gave me the space, perhaps, to confront addiction head on, and that's what this second book is about. It's about the experience of uh, homeless addiction, and I followed them then through their survive, you know, their their income generating strategies, their survival strategies, and I did that as a collaboration with a graduate student. Uh, he was getting a master's, Jeff Schonberg. Um, and he happened to be a great photographer. He didn't quite know it at the time. He, he, he admits to me now that he was just pretending. He came into my office hours and, um, and said, um, you know, I'm, uh, I, well, I, I, I was in the middle of, I had just begun the fieldwork and I realized that this was just unbelievable. You couldn't write about this and, and make it as real as it really is. People just wouldn't be able to believe the, the, the kinds of things I was seeing, specifically just the living conditions of the homeless, how filthy it was, how bloody the injection process was, how, um, you know, how, how, how desperate they were, um, and also how uh, full of life they were, how, um, you know, how they tried to, you know, how they created a whole, you know, a whole community and, and, and decorated their camps and, and had all kinds of dreams uh, in terms of their own lives. That they were that they were trying to that they were searching for, and I had been taking little snapshots and realizing that I just I couldn't tape record and observe and talk and take pictures at the same time. I just don't have that ability in my head, and I, I started looking for a, for a photographer. I'd started about maybe a week before he ha Jeff happened to walk into my office hours, and he came in with his camera, and he was going to do a master's in photo documentary. He wanted to merge anthropology and um, uh, uh, documentary journalism and education, so he'd get at you know doing something for the people you're you're studying in terms of 
of education, um, and, and, and then you know, journalism in terms of reaching a wider public, and then anthropology in terms of having that cultural relativism and, and theoretical sophistication to understand that you're, you're studying a, you know, a cultural form and, 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 and to have a critical perspective that goes beyond sort of the everyday emergency or the voyeurism that journalism you know, analyzes or just the service providing that, that education does. So, um, so do you, sorry. Do you think that's the future of anthropology, to, to have a broader public, to have that journalistic aspect? to have uh, the depth of anthropology through an anthropology degree. I, I, I wish so. You know, I mean, I, 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 could be, um, I, I, I could be dishonest and say absolutely. But, um, but I, but, and I'm, you know, in some sense, not fighting for that, but working towards that within anthropology, trying to make whatever effect that I might have on the field or might momentarily have on the field until I disappear like everyone else. Um, uh, it, to be to promote that that kind of a project to to read to reach wider audiences, and um, and the 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 frustration that that I had I mean I tried just doing that a few times you know just just doing journalism just reaching out and realized that I was just becoming confused. I was um, in an everyday emergency of addressing, you know, sort of political conjunctural crises, and I wasn't understanding anything. I wasn't seeing the big picture, um, and I wasn't able to put the, you know, I, I, I wasn't able to even sort of figure out what I should do next in some sense. I was just lurching from whatever crisis was going on at the moment. Um, uh, this was during the, the revolutions in Central America. So that's, that's why I think anthropology has so much potential in doing just what you were saying, in, in bringing sort of the rigor of social science theory. And the great thing about anthropology is it also has humanities theory. So we're both, um, you know, we're both artists and, and literary critics and philosophers, as well as social scientists. And um, it's the only field that really, or one of the only fields that really straddles two completely different and often contradictory ways of understanding and approaching the world, the humanities and the social sciences. Um, so um, by bringing that set of theory that we build and that sensibility that we have um, to address the, the, the sort of the, the urgent crises that are all around us, we really can do a lot, <laughs> I think. How, how important do you think, I mean, in your work, what really comes through is the fact that you've, you've been with these people for five, ten years, which is, even for anthropology, extraordinary mm. in terms of this long-term obsessive-compulsive obsessive <laughs> um, attachment um, to, to the people you work with, facilitated by the vicinity. I mean, six blocks. Right. I mean, my field work is um, thousands of kilometers yeah. away, which right. is right. more the norm in, in right. anthropology. Right. What role do you think that, that that has played in how you've then theorized or written about the people that are really part of your community in an everyday context rather than a more, not exoticized, but a more, you know, out there, other context that most anthropologists work in? Yeah, you know, it's just logistically, of course, it's what's made it possible. And, um, and it's also... Um, I mean, on a very personal level, it's also what keeps me sane. So, you know, when you're, 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 you're at your university, you're teaching all your students and, and so forth, you know, you get caught up in the humdrum of things and there's all kinds of squabbles between the professors and you're writing grants and stuff like that. And then the great thing about doing field work um, you know, in your on your block, on your in your hometown, right where you where you live, is all of a sudden you can step out of that world that you're in, that seems like your whole universe, um, and be somewhere completely different. So, in that sense. Um, um, it was always refreshing. I would come from a, you know, an art, a, a set of, squ of academic squabbles in the faculty meeting and, and then stop off at the homeless encampment on the way home and all of a sudden be in their world and learning about their logics and how they you know, saw their hopes and, 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 how, and what their, what, you know, how they were dealing with the police specifically. In their case, that became a big focus of the, of the book was the carceral, you know, sort of abusive management um, of, of, of poverty in the United, and addiction um, by criminalizing it. So, um, so yeah, so that, um, the, that made it possible to do the field work. 
Uh, on another um, on another level, of course, it creates a different kind of friendship, um, and and it's interesting. I mean, because I, I do have the the kind of ethnographic friendships that I'm sure you have that are a thousand you know that are a thousand miles away, right? I have that uh, with the people I originally worked with in in Central America, and you can maintain those friendships. It's hard uh, on some level just because it's far and so forth, but it's also it's also on another level quite easy because when you return and you re, you know you just hug the person and you haven't seen each other and and you're sort of also in a strange way safely distant um, on another level. With the homeless, I was really in reality. They knew where I was living. They could come and break into my windows and steal my television set, right? Which is what they specialized in doing, um, or one of the things they specialized in doing. So, uh, you know, they could also come and ask me for money when they were in a bind, and they did. They didn't steal from me. They were actually super nice to me, and they never stole anything from me. They only gave me things, actually, um, uh, which is quite extraordinary when you when you think about it. They they had absolutely nothing, and I had so much, and they um, were were generous to me. But they would uh, rare. But they did it very rarely and with respect. So it required a whole set of sort of um, of, negoti of, of of you know sort of conscious and unconscious negotiations of the friendship. Um, to try to figure out how to do it um, with, you know, sort of more structural equality than is built into the relationship when you're when you're sort of separated by um, multiple borders and thousands of miles. Um, and um, and in that sense, the main character in In Search of Respect, who I call Primo, um, is still one of my best friends. Um, and I go, whenever, whenever I go to New York, I try to visit him or I call him up. Often his phone is disconnected. He's living, it's tragic. He, he was, actually he's better now because he has a great girlfriend who has taken him into her apartment. But um, for about three, three, four years, he was living in a homeless shelter with his kids and his phone kept getting, dis you know, he didn't have enough money to pay for his phone and so forth, so it was, it was hard to maintain contact. That was like being a thousand miles away, right? All of a sudden, no cell phone. Um, uh, the new technology barriers. But, um, but so, so in that sense, um, you develop a different types of friendships. Not that, the, that, not that the friendships that I have been able to maintain in, in Costa Rica specifically aren't great friendships, but, um, but they're, they're almost magical imaginary ones in some sense. Um, every now and then, actually now with internet, the, the children of the, my main friend in Costa Rica will email me when there's an emergency and ask me to send, you know, whatever, a hundred dollar emergency doctor thing. But, um, but, but that, and, and so in that sense, boundaries are reduced um, in a way that they weren't uh, in the 1980s. I'm wondering if just on the back of that, I can ask a quick, a quick question, because I know that we're getting a little bit oh, short yeah, yeah, of time. Yeah, but long. something that's been coming up over the course of what you've been saying, so you're talking about being depressed when you're in Belize, and then oh, this yeah. idea of engaging with people in quite close quarters. So you're, you're very, very much more embedded in these sorts of communities than I think a lot of people are in, in their field work. And these are communities that you identify as, as high risk um, or victims of structural violence at the state. And I'm wondering how it is that you deal with the um, the emotion of 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 working within um, these sorts of groups of people, you know, like as a field work site. Is that something that you consciously deal with, or? Yeah, uh, I, I you know it's um, it, it it's it's definitely overwhelming, mm. and I think in some sense part of the way I think a large part of how I deal with it is is through in some in some contradictory way the shield of ethnography so it it allows me to be in the moment and see horrendous things and not completely fall apart uh, upon seeing them by by sort of saying well I I have to also document this and the nice thing with ethnography is that you can engage as a human being and, and act ethically at the moment. So if, you, if someone is beating up a little kid or something, you can, you know, you can put yourself in the, in, 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 and stop the person from beating up the little kid. Um, and, and you do do that, right? You, 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 you find yourself uh, engaging like that. But at the same time, doing ethnography, you're not instantly passing judgment 
and and also um, sort of getting uh, immediately caught up in that um, sort of savior service type of relationship that 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 services have, um, and that then and that's very healthy because a lot of the time, um, so. Uh, but but to answer your question more specifically, I think on some one level I go into denial because it's all undealable with, right? What do you do when you when you're hearing a baby shrieking and, and you know noises of hitting and so forth, right? How do you deal with that? Well, you you know you 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 have to figure out whether you should call you know a child protective services program that's even more abusive than the family in some sense. And, um, and you, you have to sort of figure out how people deal with it locally in order to, you know, find a grandmother or something who can intervene and ball out the young man who gets drunk and, you know, that, to, to, this is specifically with, the thing, one of the things that, that, that's hardest to deal with is child abuse, right? Um, and um, and uh, I do, so, I, I mean, uh, when I've been away from doing field work and I go back, um, I start, I start to realize that I can't believe that I lived with so much of that sound of crying babies in some sense. So, so there is something that happens that you somehow um, uh, you somehow disassociate uh, in some way to to sort of be able to to to, to keep operating and to to have uh, to to understand things. Um, I, I talk about this with uh, my, my, my collaborators because I work with collaborators now. I mean, I think one of the things I do also is work with collaborators because there you can, share, um, you can share your concerns with someone. You can ask them for advice. Well, what should we do about this? You know, should we you know, call the police or, you know, or, or run from the police? Um, uh, you know, and we end up, you know, having to, well, we, we, we don't, actually in this, this project we couldn't call the police, they were just too violent and brutal in, in Philadelphia. But, um, uh, but in, you know, in other places you, you might find yourself where you can trust the police, calling the police for, to help protect someone or something. But, um, so, uh, in, in, in talking with them, um, uh, you know, one of the, the I, um, um, actually, this was just told to me just recently by one of one of George Carandinas, one of my collaborators, a young. He was an undergraduate student when he started working with me. Now he's a graduate student. Um, he said that when he moved out of the neighborhood, <laughs> for the next six months, he just kept finding himself finding himself bursting into tears uh, at, at random, not even knowing why he was crying. So I think it. I think in that sense, he he was doing the field work more intensively than me. He lived for five years. This was my last project here in, in, in North Philadelphia on a heroin and cocaine selling block. It's, it's similar to In Search of Respect in that it's a Puerto Rican neighborhood that's sort of an epicenter of the, of the distribution networks of the global narcotics economy. But it's a different moment from the 1980s. This is the height of the carcer, you know, the mass incarceration of the United States. So it's a, and, and, and the extraordinary cutbacks of social services, the complete breakdown in the case of Philadelphia of public education. Our schools are just being absolutely devastated. They, they close, they're closing them. They, you know, they fired, they're, they're firing the, count, the counselors and nurses from the school schools and, and, and raising the class, you know, all the things you can't possibly do to help people or that you shouldn't possibly do. Um, so he was there for five years and, and, and living there in an apartment that, that I had rented for him. I was going up, uh, you know, a few times a week staying overnight um, at his place and, and, and we were making friends again, not just with the sellers, but we wanted to get at the larger neighborhoods, the larger communities, in this case the blocks, relationship to the sellers, which meant the, the mothers, fathers, lovers, grandmothers, um, grandfathers. Of the of the sellers to see how they were understanding um, their sons and and there were some some daughters as well involved in the selling, but mostly it's a male dominated scene, um, and um, and so um, so yeah so that so it is overwhelming on some level. At the same time, you know people are friendly to you, people are exciting, people are creative and and full of great ideas and and um, and so. You know, you actually think of the field work in the moment as great fun. You know, it, it's like super, super exciting. 
and and you sort of can't believe how everyone is being so friendly to you and telling you you know everything about their way of seeing the world because they get excited about the project you know and I, I go in and I show them in search of respect and say look I did this book in the 1980s I now want to do another book um, to show what street life is like in the 2010s and they say well you better have at least two or three chapters on me <laughs> I, I, you know, I have great stories to tell so people like to get engaged with it and um, they like to be taken seriously which you know just like you and I would love to be taken just like this you come and interview me you know wow I'll tell you anything yeah I'll talk for um, uh, so we love to be you know heard and have a platform for for getting what we think is important out so that's how they understand the project as well and and in that sense, it feels great to do that. Um, you can talk about their dreams, you can talk about their struggles, you can talk about what, what's hurting them and what, what could possibly help them. Maybe on that empowering and positive note, yeah. we'll finish the official part yeah, yeah, of the yeah, interview. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for having Thank us, you. Philip. Sorry for talking so much. <laughs>